either. So thank you for the uh, the warm introduction. Uh, GitOps can do a lot, though. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, look, I've been in the software industry, like was said, about 20 years, blah, 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 multiple industries. Uh, nowadays, what's relevant to this is I spend a lot of my time talking about the boundary between development and operations. So sort of the DevOps thing. Uh, Red Hat's pretty obsessed with DevOps. I'm wearing my Red Hat livery right now. Uh, OpenShift is an example of that. You'll see some of OpenShift tonight. I, I like to call it Kubernetes for developers, but you can decide. Um, but today it's all about GitOps, which is right on brand for somebody like me. So this happy, unassuming little fellow here, uh, he's the mascot of one of the foremost of these kind of GitOps open source projects called Argo CD, which is one of the things I'm going to be using today to demonstrate some of the hopefully real world benefits of GitOps, not just theory. There'll be a little bit of theory. So this mascot is a good representation because it's generally GitOps in general is sort of an overlooked idea that, if you will, belies its power. And I'm here to argue that this isn't just any old squid in a spacesuit. So GitOps has Cthulhu, I think this is a Lovecraft thing. I don't know, I've, Cthulhu's come up before, but it has that level of powers, but uh, for, for good, let's say, not for evil. I think he's, he looks pretty evil. Um, but it's, it's like, well, I'll explain more why I think this. But first, when it comes to GitOps, I'm betting, uh, this isn't an official poll, but I'm betting you might fall into one of these four categories. You might be kind of neutral, like, eh, I've never heard of it. I'm here to hear about it. Like you, like I saw in the polls, some of you guys do infrastructure as code. Eh, okay, what's GitOps? Others are a little confused. They don't really understand what the heck that means. Everything, just slap an ops at the end of it, and suddenly it's trendy, like DevOps. Some are incredulous. Again, infrastructure as code, code, I've heard it all before. Those people probably aren't in this call unless they're looking to heckle me. Um, or some love it. And they see this squiddy thing. Again, if anyone can tell me what animal that's supposed to be, uh, they see it for its Cthulhu level superpowers. And that's where I'd like to get any of you, hopefully you're in these two camps, maybe the angry people I could move over to the thumbs up side of GitOps. Now I wanna convince you mostly by way of a demo. So most, I have like 20 minutes worth of demo. So I recorded it to try and fit it all. So, I, and I can scrub through it if we are running low on time but I feel like it's the best way to kind of take the theory and show it. Uh, the demo is gonna be around this happy little site that's called the Cool Store. Um, if you look at the Cool Store from the bottom up, what's the infrastructure for this little kind of toy site? Um, let's just pretend it's just a little concern. Let's say a subsidiary of Red Hat and they sell all kinds of Red Hat merch. This is kind of what it looks like today in their you know, staging or production environment. It's called staging in my demo. So it's a typical microservice setup, a whole bunch of microservices, each with their own little database. There's some Kafka thrown in, also trendy. Just wait for Kafka ops. I'm sure this will be a thing before too long. But let's pretend for the sake of the demo, I have been asked as a developer to make our Kafka, this kind of payment service, make this more event-driven with a serverless type technology like Knative. Some of you may have heard my Knative talk on this very channel once upon a time. So this requires not just a code change, but an infrastructure change, which is interesting because the Red Hat store people, the cool store people use GitOps in their day-to-day. -day. So let's just take a quick look at what we mean by this store. So this is OpenShift. These are a couple of things you're gonna see. This is the developer view in OpenShift. And here's the main part of the cool store UI. So I can click on that. And this is running inside my Kubernetes cluster. I can buy fun things like fedoras and all that very keeping in brand. I can fill in credit card details. And when I check out, I can see that again, here it is in my staging environment, it's processing an order. And then there, it's all done. The payment status is completed. Now I make a point of this because we'll come back to this if we're lucky, if time allows at the end, remember, <laughs> remember that credit card number and that name and that order ID. You guys can commit that to memory, right? See if it comes up again at the end of the talk. So before I go too much farther, just a little bit of theory about understanding GitOps. So let's start with the word Git. Git is a darling of open source software development as well as general software development. Most of you probably know about it. Here's a representation of GitOps uh, or Git, I should say. 
So Git allows collaboration at a distance. It's a revision control system. It's for software. People can put other things in it. Don't, don't put binary things in it. That's bad. But text and stuff like that, like source code, works great. Also, infrastructure as code. It's by its nature, it's it's for iterative. It's meant to be an iterative approach. Each of these nodes represents a distinct change in the code, a check-in, if you will. Governance is done by a pull request. We'll hear more about pull requests in a second. You have a history of what's happened. So history is built into Git. And there's a bit of an audible record that comes with that history. I can look back and see a given file and see how it's changed over time, just for my learning or for just general benefit. On the other side, you have ops. Let me pontificate about ops a little bit. I haven't done tons of system administration, but I have worked in the kind of DevOps space a bit. And ops, as far as I can understand, is an ever-involving discipline. So it used to be more about managing servers, like you see here, just about the name servers. But it's grown to be more than that, as the servers are more abstracted away, like behind a cloud. Worst case, ops typically was parallel to developers. They were on the other side of the wall, and DevOps is trying to move those two things together. And infrastructure on demand, like the cloud and stuff like that, is forcing ops to move faster and not be happy with things like click ops, for instance, which is just one-off changes to environments. Environments need to be made repeatedly. And also with DevOps, it means you want to have self-service but as you would know, SREs or just operators, if you've been on a support roster, which I've been, stability is a big concern. And comes, what comes with that is governance. So you don't want just anyone doing stuff with your, with your precious servers, which leads us to put the two together as GitOps, which I'm saying it's operations as if it were bitten by a radioactive developer. So sort of like Spider-Man became super, I think, radioactive spiders. Think of it as the powers of development imbued in ops. And we'll see how that plays out. And that's why the Cthulhu metaphor, which you'll see over and over again. Here are some of the super superpowers uh, that I'm going to show in the demo. Each stage of the demo will show a different one or two of these superpowers. Um, but before that, there's just a little bit more theory. But I will stop for a second and make sure I'm actually still talking to people. Can people still hear me? Loud and clear. All right, excellent. So let's start with the tool chain. This is the best way to get a foothold into understanding what the heck GitOps is for, for real, not just Git and Ops smashed together or radioactive developers or whatever I'm babbling on about. So a typical model is, if you will, kind of a push model. Now, not all CICD chains would have a, a Git repo in here that's kind of foreshadowing what we're going to do. And this, this is another open source mascot called Tecton, uh, which is what I'm using as my continuous integration chain. So on the left, you go from continuous integration, the building of assets, all the way to continuous deployment, those assets being ready to go and move to production at a moment's notice. Typically, it's the tool chain that manages that. It knows where the environments are and it deploys to them. But GitOps kind of changes that a little bit and it says the tool chain is divorced from where you're gonna deploy. And that's one of the first big things that happens. So in our case, Argo takes over and deals with the continuous deployment. And the tool chain is left to be the continuous integration and those separation of concerns. With that separation of concerns comes some real power, which we'll see in just a second. And here's what we'll see in the demo. We'll see that kind of, this is our little continuous integration. It ends with checking in infrastructure and also checking in or having published a binary. We'll see those two steps. and. Argo then pulls those two, two things together to create you an environment, right? And the last bit of theory is the almighty pull request. So again, those of you who are more on the ops side maybe aren't super familiar with pull requests. So most people in the world probably are. I'll just explain it briefly because it's so central to how GitOps works. So here, if this is the main branch of my development, code, infrastructure, it doesn't matter. If I want to work on that, Instead of getting in the middle of this and messing things up, I can take a copy of it and work on it myself. This little developer person can work on it there. Now, the happy path, when they're all done, they check it back in into the main branch. And Argo, as we saw before, kind of watches a branch of Git and deploys that. It can do other things, but let's just pretend it's looking at a branch and it deploys what's in the branch. But the real power of the pull request comes when your check-in is rejected. So there's some governance that happens, but you, not just anyone 
it's not necessarily a given that anyone can just check back into the branch. There has to be some sort of code review, some sort of gating. And this is where governance can come in and where you can get some of the benefits of self-service while still managing some amount of governance. Because if you reject it, you either abandon the branch or that developer continues to fix on that branch until you can get the thumbs up. Excellent. So now demo, it's pretty much demo with a slide here or there until, until the end. So I'll just stop here. Just any questions, anything I should know before I go deeper into it? I think we're all good just now. Yeah, just Perfect. encourage you, if you've got any questions, whack them in for the, the question buttons on the left-hand side. All right. Excellent. Mostly I'm just checking in because I'm nervous that I've, I've lost you all. So I have abandonment issues when it comes to, to meetups and speaking. So let's talk about this infrastructure or, if you will, environments as code. So yeah, obviously that's one of the most obvious benefits. So we'll look at that uh, the most. So I want to stress that there's still room for something like a click ops. People keep on developing more and more UIs that allow you to make infrastructure quickly. It's just really a question of where that click ops should be. So I'll try and couch that in this, place that in my demo. So let's go back to our cool store friends and see what the GitOps kind of tool chain looks like for them. So looking, so this is where we kind of checked in. And now what we're going to take a look at is I'm going to open up uh, the Git repo that's at the center of the GitOps demo here. So this is running in my Kubernetes cluster. This is something called Git-T, just sort of like you know GitHub. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually change code. And this is stuff that we've seen before. But in this code that I'm changing, this is the payment microservice. What I'm typing in here, let's pretend I've just checked in all the code that makes this a serverless binary. When I check it in, that starts a pipeline that you can kind of see running. You'll see a little more in just a second. Oops, sorry, I must have, uh, sorry, we had a hitch there. Basically, as the tool chain runs, it's gonna just build a binary in the way that we understand. While that's building, let's just take a quick look. There are two repos, right? There's one for our binary artifact that turns into an image in Kubernetes land. And that's the payment service. That's what I just edited. I just edited code to make it serverless. That's what we're, that's a conceit of this. And then this is my GitOps repo, right? So that's the thing that the CI chain is gonna check into. It's gonna say, here's all the infrastructure. Now you're gonna hear a little more about this. You see customization. Some of you guys may know uh, this. Customization sort of a, a patching uh, functionality for Kubernetes allows arbitrary patching. We'll talk about it maybe a little more before we uh, before we're done. But that's just showing that Argo knows about things like customization. As we go deeper in, we can see I have some support databases and stuff like that. I have the actual main elements of my deployment. So you'll see here a cart. You know, I'll have all all the things you saw in the developer view before briefly. A cart, a catalog all these kind of things, right? So my whole infrastructure for the environment that we saw in the beginning for CoolStore is codified in this repo. And payment right now, and this is important for later, is just a vanilla deployment, right? So payment as it was in staging, what's in the GitOps repo right now, it's just a deployment, and this is gonna be overridden by customized with whatever the current image is. So that's an obvious place where you need patching. What is the image that's actually being deployed, right? Um, cool. This is again just showing it's a plain vanilla service. I might just skip through some of this just for the sake of time. Meanwhile, our build is building our binary, not the GitOps. It's just building a binary. And what it's going to do is it's going to build this binary, and I'll just skip through a lot of this. It's just going to make my serverless service, right? So we'll take a look at it. This is my dev environment, my more of a sandbox environment. And this is just showing that, like, hey, I've got my serverless payment. And what goes with the serverless payment is not just the fact that it's serverless, but it has some extra infrastructure, an event source, because I want to read in orders from a Kafka queue. And that's what you're seeing here. So I have a Kafka queue or a cluster inside my Kubernetes cluster that I'm referring to. It's going to listen on orders that will wind up patching that for every environment. Every environment will have different topics. Uh, and then I'm just going to give it a name and create it. And then cool thing will happen is I'm just going to 
send a route, you know, I'm going to send a message to it just to prove that it works in development. So this is like what a developer would be doing. I'm trying things locally. Yeah, it works. Well, I hope it works. Let's see. So I can look at the queue here. I don't have a whole environment. I'm just playing in my sandbox. Cool. Now I'm going to curl, curl the request. If you see that come through to the route, it spins up my Knative service. And I see that, oh, there's my serverless build. Remember that. We'll see that before, before we're done. And there it is. So we've got to find a way to get that to staging. So this change, how are we going to get it to staging? Oh, GitOps. How will we do it, Magic Squid? Um, the second thing that the Magic Squid can do, Cthulhu in disguise, uh, is another is something that happens when you couple this notion of GitOps, which we just barely touched upon in our demo, with something uh, called a GitOps agent. So that's where Argo CD comes in. Argo CD is kind of a, uh, our, a GitOps agent, like a GitOps operator almost, right? And in fact, you can install Argo on a cluster as an operator. So in our demo world, Argo CD is actively managing our staging environment and we'll play around with that. So our staging environment as it's reflected in a branch and a specific revision of our Git repo. So let's take a look at some of the features that come with that. So this is one way that it's more powerful than infrastructure as code, because what I can do is just, I'm gonna make a new tab here and I'm gonna take a look at First, the fact that, hey, like I said, I installed it with an operator. So it makes it really easy to install something like Argo on your cluster. Uh, it has a custom resource called an Argo CD, and that defines you know, in YAML, and there's a UI as well, but you know, there's a whole bunch of Kubernetes 1.18 managed field stuff. Ooh, how I hate it. But there's all kinds of stuff in there that tells you how Argo should run. This is the actual Argo server, and here's the UI into Argo. It's uh, the operator allows it to be OAuthed with OpenShift credentials. So that's kind of cool. Argo looks at the world in terms of its own applications. So here's an application, Cool Store Argo. And Cool Store Argo maps to an environment. So I've mapped it to this staging environment that you saw before. Up here, you see how it's mapping back to this Git repo that I showed you in the earlier video. And it's synced to that video, video, uh, repo and it thinks, hey, everything's, up, everything's synced. So the environment is matching what's in Git. Argo allows you to kind of look at like sort of uh, assets and then spawns of those assets. So you can reason about the environment and you can look at all the events that happened as it tried to take what was in Git and make it reality in Kubernetes land. And that's some of what I'm just scrolling through there. Sorry, it's so small. It doesn't work so great to blow it way up. They could use some you know, reactive design there. Yeah. Any questions while we're waiting just a second? There, there are a few questions on the questions tab. Uh, probably yeah. I can flick one to you. So the, the first one is from Kevin, uh, which is about given a deployment over multiple environments, some in the same tier and some not, how do you automate a gradual release once they pass earlier gates in the pipeline? Yeah, when they're, the way you might do that is you might, perhaps I'll come back to that at the end because this will kind of show how releases are gated. One way is through that mighty pull request, for instance. So uh, yeah, that's sort of the GitOps, a full on GitOps way of thinking about it. So can we come back to that at the end? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, what, what I might do also, Mark, I can, if you allow us, I'll run a cheeky poll. I just want to check. <laughs> I just want to check if folks are, you know, what uh, flavor of, you know, Kubernetes are you using today? So I've just fired up a poll um, which asks for what distribution of Kubernetes you're doing. So if folks can very quickly, you know, flick some answers in. Um, then we can continue. I hope it's a cheeky but not pretentious poll. <laughs> pretentious <laughs> poll. It's cheeky but not pretentious. You know, it's very, very difficult to get the balance right. Yeah, it, it's, it is very difficult. I'm not Shiraz. You know, you like them cheeky but not pretentious. <laughs> cool. All right. Sounds good. All right. Any other questions at this moment? That I'll just bat away and so I'll answer at the end. Uh, we've got one uh, one other question from uh, Samuel. He's asking uh, whether um, GitOps and all its goodness is only applicable for workloads that run on Kubernetes. 
it's it's not that's a great question kubernetes is particularly um ripe for the picking when it comes to GitOps because of its declarative yamily kind of nature but uh GitOps does apply to things like you know AWS and public cloud environments, Azure, by way of things like Terraform. So anything that can codify services in terms of code, whether that's you know a cloud formation script or Terraform or something like that, then you have the potential to have something like a GitOps. And there are operators that can handle that as well. I'm just not a scholar on that. I'm very Kubernetes-centric at the moment. Anything? Uh, any others? All the questions just now, I think. Cool. Yep. Yeah, cool. So, Continuing on here in GitOps land, this is Argo CD. Just really quickly, you can see it's it's pointing to a specific repo and it's set up to sync automatically and it's set up to self-heal. Sounds interesting. Sounds like a Kubernetes type thing. And again, this is the repo that's in cluster. That's my little Gitty demo repo that we saw before that had cool store binary in the GitOps. And it's watching the namespace, the Kubernetes namespace, Argo CD demo stage. It has a, this is the manifest, just kind of saying, hey, this app is in cluster, in this cluster. Argo can deploy to clusters outside of this cluster, uh, just as an aside. Uh, again, for the sake of time, I might kind of skip through some of this. So the next thing we're going to see is just a fun little, let's see how we can break, try and break our environment. So let's pretend here we are in the staging of GitOps, Argo CD on the left. Developer perspective of the staging environment on the right. So all the microservices are here on the right. So if I take the cool store UI and I go, ah, I don't like that thing. What the hell is that doing there? And I try and delete it. What we'll see, though I got the uh, framing of this wrong, you notice that uh, Argo CD noticed it right away. It might be small to see. It notices that a pod disappeared, and it quickly recreates that pod, which you kind of see in the corner here. It took me a while to find it when I was recording it. The cool thing there is that I can also even go deeper and say, oh, OK, Argo, well played. Well, what if I go in and I change an image on you? I think you're so smart. So I'll change that to the broken tag, right? Just arbitrary change to the YAML. And I save that. And right away, like you'd expect from like an operator or something like this, it changes it back. So because I've set Argo up to sync, to keep this environment in sync with that folder of the Git repo, it'll constantly be making sure that everything matches that repo, everything that's under its control. Things that aren't under its control, if I just spin up some random thing, it won't kill it. It's only things that it knows about that it's represented in this view here. And as you can see, you can go back and you can see that, hey, it's back to Docker version one. Awesome. So that's called configuration drift. And that self-healing is one of the key things that makes GitOps kind of so powerful. Next is what we kind of talked about before, this decoupling of the tool chain, the CI chain, you need to know what environment it's releasing to. So what if, so one way that this decoupling gives us some benefit is what if when I want to make the change, so I as a developer had made a change, let's pretend I want to spin up an environment as an operations team to look at every change that comes through. This is possible with GitOps, because GitOps, you just point it to a branch and you say, hey, make that branch an environment, right? Subject to some provisos that you actually set out your, your, uh, your YAML correctly in a folder. See my repo if you want to see an example of that. Let's take a quick look at that. And we're going to fail. I'm going to spoil something. We're going to fail a deployment. So we'll see how the mighty pull request helps us. So now we're going to look at the second tool chain. So this is the CI chain. This is how it passes off to GitOps. So it's going to check into the GitOps repo by checking out the config repo, patching it based on the image and a couple other things, and then it's going to check it in. So first, I have to know which build has the binary that I want to patch my deployment for. So I start it. I give the build number of the binary. I say the source revision. I want to go from master, you know, make a branch off of master for a uh, that's going to become a pull request. So I'm going to make a special branch. And I'm going to use this fun little feature of Argo CD just to take it to its logical conclusion and say, yes, make me an environment from that branch. Why don't you? That'd be nice. And I'm going to kick it off. And when I kick it off, it checks out the code just, just like you'd expect, right? So this is Tekton in action. I'm going to time lapse some of this. So I'm going to go through. I'm going to check it out. I'm going to actually patch. So I'm going to run customize over the top of it 
which will allow me to fill in images and do a couple other things. You saw the strategic merge kind of go by. And then I'm going to check in, and you'll see that I'm creating a branch called CI, and then the name of the, the build number, 96B6J. You kind of see the Git, typical Git stuff come through, for those of you who've dealt with Git. And then once the payload check-in is complete, I'm just going to alert Argo and say, hey, Tekton can talk to Argo and say, hey, there's a new branch for you. You should take a look at it. And you can see here, Argo knows about my preview environment, so it creates a preview environment for me to build all this infrastructure into. And if I jump to that preview environment, I'm a bit slow off the draw, but you can see it kind of things pop into existence, like the, cob the cobbler's elves making all my microservices for me, right? So I check, this is just a pull request. Remember that developer who had his branch, I haven't done anything to the main, the staging stays the same. And thank God it is, because as you can see, there's a problem here with payment. So Argo notices it in its teeny tiny font and OpenShift, the developer perspective of OpenShift also notices that there's a problem with payment. So uh, we're not gonna go deep into the problem. I'll just tell you, you can look at the logs and you can find out, oh no, it's they can't find orders. It's an infrastructure issue because I checked in a binary that was expecting to be serverless in, without the infrastructure. So what I can do here is I can say, ah, that preview branch, I'm gonna give it the thumbs down I can clean up that branch as quickly as it came. So all the pods disappear, namespace disappears. When it's deleted out, I can go back and show that in the GitOps repo, there was a pull request that was made, which you see up here in my, my own little GitHub. I can see that that was generated by Tekton. Tekton just kind of checked that in. I could merge it in. If I merged it in, it would go into staging or in my master branch, which is governing my staging environment. But no, I already saw that it's broken. By the way, we'll see more of this later, but I can look at the diff. And I noticed that, oh, okay, I patched the image, but I don't see any infrastructure in here for my Knative stuff. Oh, that's probably the problem. Stupid developer, stupid, stupid. Should have Should have done something about infrastructure, right? So that means that this pull request is failed because it doesn't work and I can close it. Now you can imagine having automated testing running instead of a person doing this, but for the sake of the demo, I'm just showing you, use your imagination after that. I can't do everything for you. So that's the idea. And I can delete that branch and say, well, that was a failed experiment. All right, cool. Any questions there? I think we're all good. Cool. All right, good. Thank God I'm still coming through. That's good. Only a couple more to go. So. Customize is the next thing that we, we're going to touch on one more time. So customize is like another superpower. I don't know. This is stupid Mortal Kombat. It's kind of annoying, a picture. But I was just like, oh, it's a, it's a callback to, to a nicer time. Not really. But customize is another one of these kind of overlooked sometimes superpowers. Uh, Apply-K for those of you who have modern versions of Kubernetes. Let's see how it and Argo, how they're good friends, like Batman and Robin. So. One thing I talked about was click ops, right? So if I'm a developer, I should be able to use the UI to make stuff. But one of the cool things about Kubernetes is anything I make, I can script, sort of. I can turn it into YAML. And that's what you kind of see here. I'm using the Knative CLI to make YAML out of my Knative service and also this Kafka event service that does the event-driven side of the uh, Knative serverless. Now I'm not gonna, you have to pick a couple things out of that YAML and anyone who's dealt with Kubernetes would know how to do that. Here is a branch I prepared earlier. So the way I do that is once I take my click op stuff, I turn it into something that should be production ready and I check it in to the GitOps repo under a branch. I put it in a serverless branch for right now. And you can see here, now I have my Kafka source, right? That's a diff. So that's a new thing. Instead of a deployment, instead of a service, I have a Kafka source. And I patch it because it needs to know what topic, what topic it's looking at. I say orders patch because I name the topic by the environment. Remember, I'm spinning up environments willy-nilly. So this is just showing the deployment goes away, and it's going to show you that the uh, Knative service kind of goes away. I'm going to skip through some of this. So we've got Knative services, images. So this looks a bit better. This seems more like it's going to work, right? And all these things, payment slash image, we use customize to do that. And Argo knows, as you saw how I laid out my repo, it knows how to work with customize. So if it finds a folder where it sees a customization.yaml, 
it knows what to do with it. And it runs customize over the top of it for those of you who are familiar with customize. So Batman and Robin, when it comes to or Katana and, and Squid Tank, when it comes to Argo and customize. Uh, almost done. Last two is in order to keep the pace of DevOps, like I talked about, we want developers to self-service like we just saw, but we also want to make sure that we have some ability to govern. So we'll look at the mighty pull request in this next section so we can kind of see infrastructure code reviews, if you will. And the other benefit is that we have tool chains that aren't in God mode anymore. You don't need to have super permissions in the tool chain because a tool chain isn't the thing that actually changes the environment that gets passed to the operator, which generally can be closer to the environment that it manages. A little different in my case, but you get the idea, I hope. So if we look at that, so this is back to where we were. Um, oops, sorry. Let's go back here. I'm just cutting to the chase here. This is where we were. We were looking at the diff. If I look at the pipeline, I want to find, I want that build number again, and I'm going to run my promotion pipeline one more time, but this time with the build number, so that's the binary, but I'm going to use my serverless branch, which has infrastructure that I actually hand change. And I'm going to say, I want you to make a branch with that image from the serverless branch and make a pull request to go back to the master. And that's what we're going to see here. So once again, same old thing. I'm going to skip through this. This is what I meant to skip through before. So you clone it, right? You patch it, just like we talked about before. You notice the Kafka source kind of comes through, the topics, all that kind of stuff. So it's patching as we'd expect. I'm making a branch. I deleted the CI blah, blah, blah branch before, but now it's making a brand new one based on the serverless branch. And once that's done, it tells like it did before, because I said create a, a development environment or preview environment, that's what it's doing here. So it's doing just like we saw before, but this time the preview environment has the infrastructure that I'd expect. So it has the Knative, Knative service as well as the Knative source, right? Which you see rendered here in all OpenShift's wisdom. So those all kind of pop into existence, which is kind of cool as GitOps Argo is busy trying to finish syncing and then you can see the, the commit messages there. So you have an idea of like, oh, what is it that made this come into being? So assuming you have good Git hygiene, you get some of the benefits of that. Though I know that's that's not always a given. I can see that I have my two infrastructure, the Kafka orders, the Knative service. And then really quickly, I think we're going to skip through this last bit. So I go into the cool store, which is running in this environment. There are no orders. It's a completely different environment. That's what I'm trying to prove there. And then when I go and I buy myself a sticker, that's all I deserve right now because I'm running a bit long. So with tax, that's a $12 sticker. That's worth it. Check that out. And I look at the orders and this time, hopefully my binary should come through and it, well, it beat me there. It did, so completed serverless build. So this is saying that my binary made it all the way through. So I like the preview environment was great, but I don't need it anymore. Let's pretend that was all the testing that I do. We're pretty lax here in cool store land. And what I'm going to do in preparation for the next bit is I'm going to disable auto sync because I want to show some of that infrastructure as code, some of that code review -y type goodness. So there won't be any auto sync, even though I'll check into master, Argo is going to stop. It's just going to tell me that, hey, something changed. When we look at that, and this is sort of back to that question when how to use gate environments. So Argo doesn't have to work automatically. That's one way you can gate. The other way you can gate is by things getting merged into a branch. Remember our pull request had that merge? That's what we're going to do now. This time it worked. I can look at the diff from Git. So I can just use Git. We're going to see another way I can look at the diff. But I'll just, yeah, here it is there. Oh my gosh, staring at code. That's a lot of code. A lot of YAML, I should say. So checking in, hey, it looks good. I had a comment to it, so I have a record of it. And then I can merge the request. Ideally, I'd fill in this, but you know, I'm a developer. I don't write check-in messages. Then I merge the request, and I see that it's merged. Now that will cause Argo to realize that there's a change. And the cool thing is that Argo uses its knowledge of Kubernetes plus Git to give you an even better picture of what's what's different. So Git was one way of looking at it. Take a look at this. So now it understands, oh, my payment service is gone. Not only did it notice the images that the um, order topics, it noticed that these Kubernetes elements have disappeared from the manifest, if you will. 
and new ones have been added, which we see at the end here, right? Like payment is gone. And then when we scroll to the end, here's our new infrastructure that represents the key native aspects, right? Let me scroll through this. And then when I'm ready, I can watch what happens. So it does a very, it does delicate little patching to the environment. It doesn't just blow it all away. It knows, just like checking in code, it just applies a patch to the environment. So when it syncs, you'll notice that most of the services stay unaffected, payment gets knocked out, and then we put in our new Knative service and the event source that goes with the Knative service. And I'll just kind of run through this. So it pops into existence, which is awesome. I can open the URL in this environment, my staging environment. And kind of the cool thing here is that I you know, buy something and skipping to the end of that, you notice there's the order from before. So it wasn't destructive at all. The data is still there. And now I see I have my serverless build, which is pretty cool. I got my stuff all the way to staging. If I have one last thing to show, there's this cool thing that what you get with Git is I said, you get an audit history and that's awesome. So not only do I have the ability to look at some infrastructure and look at it in Git and look at the commit history and see how that infrastructure changed or why it might be there, I also get rollback ability. Now you would say, oh, Kubernetes already handles rollbacks and that's true. But does Kubernetes allow you to go bring everything back to a point in time? And that's some of the cool thing that once you've abided by the principles of GitOps, you get this ability to go back to almost any revision, assuming all your check-ins into master are compilable as developers would tend to strive to do. You can now bring environments into existence, a higher order thing than just the code and the images running in the environments. So let's pretend for some reason, maybe I had a bug or maybe because the futility of life, I'm gonna bring the staging environment back to the way it was when we started. So the way that works is we can even use Git. So here's just a, this is fork. This is something, uh, just a UI to Git. So I've cloned locally and I've used its revert functionality and I'm gonna push that revert. So I'm going back to the check-in before I merged that pull request. Argo's gonna notice that. And when I refresh it, you notice that it says, oh, here's my Kubernetes help to the diff. And you notice, oh, okay, payment changed. And here's how that's changed as well as some of the other things. Oh, some bits of payment are coming back and other stuff's going away. So when I sync it up, what I expect to see is all the Knative goodness to disappear and payment to come back. So when I go and I actually click, when I click the sync button, not only can you see the check-in messages while we're waiting, but you see it tear down just the bits that changed and bring it back into existence, the normal, the old service from before. And if I go in, we'll like just skip through this. I can go in and buy something. I don't know, I deserve a shirt this time because I got to the end. And when I check it out, what I should see when I look at the orders is that it's processing. And then when it's completed at the end, it goes back to the previous binary, right? So I brought everything back to the previous revision. Um, and that's it. That's all I had. There's a whole bunch. So I have a whole bunch of links in the slide. If I can mail that out, anonymize that, launder that through Amanda and Steve and everybody, um, you can have access to this, whether it's OpenShift, this repo, there's a link to the official Argo CD site, as well as the operator. Um, that's about it. So yeah, I went through without dropping out. It's a personal best for me. Yeah, nice one. There are a few questions flowing in, but uh, given I'm the MC, I'm going to just <laughs> ask a question <laughs> without popping one in. So I think I, I love the philosophy of GitOps and everything. I, I just wanted to know, or from your experience, are there any limitations that you've seen around GitOps and things like Argo and the others? Uh, there's a couple. Like, for instance, not everybody would be able to translate something they did in ClickOps land into actual infrastructure. That's kind of one. And I think GitOps also suffers a little bit from the, that's all great until you have stateful environments. So this notion of rolling forward and backwards and all those, well, that depends on how much state you have in your environment. If I had a version to change where the, I rolled the environment back, but my database has been rolled to a different schema, you can kind of see where that could get more and more complicated. Um, 
but in general, like if you are already infrastructure as code, you may consider, you don't have to do whole environments. You can do subsets of environments. Argo can be as small or as, as large as you'd like it to be, particularly in Kubernetes land. So gives you some, some idea, right? But yeah, I understand not everything can be coaxed into this GitOps infrastructure as code, nor would you. Some developers won't go within a hundred feet of or yeah. meters of YAML. Yeah, that sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so I think we touched on the environments uh, question, which was asked earlier. But just for the sake of completeness, I'll ask just ask again. So given a deployment over multiple environments, some in the same tier and not, how do you automate a gradual release through GitOps? So as you saw, you could either have branches. You can do it like take the developer's view and look at it as sort of a Git flow kind of thing, where you just have you go from different branches. Or there's an old school way of looking at Git where you have your mass, you know, you have your master branch, and then you have a branch for every environment. You can just promote things, merge all the way down to the environment. So you could do it from the Git side, or you can have again your tool chain trigger Argo, right? Like tell Argo, okay, just like you saw, I triggered Argo to say you should look at this Git repo now and build it out. You can still have a CI chain do that, or have any, any, you know, anything that can make a curl request tickle Argo, if you will, to kind of pull in those tool chains. So whether you yeah. want to do it in, in a, you know, imperatively or whether you want to do it, you know, through Git, both of those options are open to you. Yeah. I've right. even seen people drive it through Jira, stuff like that, for instance. Oh, wow. Jira. <laughs> yeah, I know. Good times. Workflow <laughs> engines. Nice one. Cool. On that side note. Oh, sorry. Happy note. Next question. Um, so uh, I believe, so the question is, I believe typically the various microservices are separated into different Argo CD applications. Do you think there are advantages of monolithic Argo CD applications representing the whole environment like in this demo or yeah. compared to a split? Yeah, uh, it's kind of like the horses for courses. Sometimes you want a monolith, sometimes you want microservices. Uh, if you split everything, the good news about splitting all the repos up is that they can operate more independently. The bad news about what I did, even though it was easy to understand, this is the environment, now I can spin up the whole environment all monolithically, is that um, everything has to get spun up, even when I made a change to the payment service and you notice there were like four or five other services there. Uh, typically people will, well, I don't know, I can't, I can't necessarily speak typically. What I've seen, some of the reference architectures that I've seen is that all the all the binaries are in their own repo and they poke into the environment mm -hmm. as a monolith sometimes, or whatever your closest monolith is. I want to reason about this environment, my cool store as a monolith. But yeah, you can split them up into separate repos, which is great, but then you run into the problem where those versions may be incompatible. So I may roll back one environment and suddenly it's incompatible with what another environment expects of that environment, that kind of thing. Does, does that kind of answer the question? So it's sort of like, just like we've taken ops and kind of made it like a developer's problem by imbuing it with the power of Git, that means it's the same thing when you try and make sense of your environments. It's almost like a monolith to microservice kind of weighing up with advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, spot on. Yeah, and I think uh, in my experience as well, I've seen both the models uh, in place and your mileage may vary. It all depends on your tool chain maturity, uh, how can you deal with split repos or versus a monolithic repo? Yeah, no, nice one. Um, next one, movie. Sorry, I'm rushing through the questions uh, <laughs> because we wanted to jump to the next one as well. Yes. But this is a good one. So what are some key differences between Argo uh, CD for GitOps versus Weaveworks Flux? And I... Yeah, go. Yeah, I'm not an expert on Flux. Argo is the thing that kind of crossed my desk. I understand Flux probably uh, Weaveworks are the ones that invented GitOps as so far as I yep. understand it. So somebody more experienced would have to say in terms of what the differences are. The aims are similar from what I've read, but I haven't worked with Flux directly. Yeah, and I've, I read somewhere, I think they've been, uh, Flux and Argo might have joined forces or at least the developers might have joined forces in knowledge sharing and combined you know, experience or whatever. Uh, but not, that's a that's a good one. Uh, next one, are there any standard tools for setting up automation of sending pull request when you want to promote a new revision to an environment? Is that built into Tekton? It's, it's anything built into Tekton. See my other talk on Tekton that I did here. Uh, Tekton, I was able to pull some from, Tekton has a community 
So there's an open source community and a whole bunch of open source Tecton tasks that do this kind of thing. I wound up rolling my own, but my repo is now part of the greater world of open source there on GitHub. Uh, but uh, I'm sure if you look around things like Jenkins or Jenkins X, uh, they would have plugins into Argo. Argo is well understood enough that probably you should look first to see if there's a plugin or for Tecton, an existing catalog task or pick a thing or even source code. Like you can look at my repo if you wanna see different ways of doing pull requests. The thing that you will find though is environments are very different. So plugins may get you 80% of the way there, but usually you're gonna find some little thing that uh, is just bespoke idiosyncratic to your environment. And then you wind up having to pull your own, which is one of the reasons why I use Tecton for all my demos. It's infinitely flexible. Yeah, cool. Nice one. plug for Tecton. <laughs> nice one. Uh, probably final last uh, two questions, I'll say. Um, so first one is, and I think this talks to templating in general, are there any stand standard tools for doing templating of Kubernetes YAML? I mean, that's an emotional topic, but anyway, um, <laughs> you used customize. Have you played with KPT? Is customize the blessed tool for Argo? Uh, no, in fact, uh, it also uses uh, Sonnet is in there. And there's another one that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. There's a whole bunch of, uh, yeah. Argo doesn't pick favorites with that. Customize is just the one that I, I had some familiarity with. So I used it. Um, but yeah, there's a whole there's a whole bunch. And if you look at the the link, if you if you get this presentation, there's a link to, or you can just Google it, you'll see that Argo works with a whole bunch of different templating, patching kind of protocols. Customize is built into Kubernetes as well, since yeah. Kubernetes 114. So that's kind of why I used it. Everybody's gonna have some aspect of customize, whether they know it or not, unless you have an ancient version of Kubernetes. <laughs> yep, no, brilliant. Um, and last one is from Matt Thorley, and this is more security related. So uh, what are some of the key attack vectors or concerns of GitOps if I'm operating as a malicious insider? Uh, well, with GitOps, if you really have a lockdown version of GitOps, your vulnerabilities become the repo itself which is usually well locked down if it's something that is internal to your business. But the whole point is that when you break the tool chain off from knowing about the environments and ha having, if you will, like this, like I said, God mode ability to spawn up environments, your whole tool chain is no longer an attack vector. You kind of narrow it to the GitOps repo. And then the Argo, like if you imagine Kubernetes, like let's pretend only the production environment pulls GitOps. That operator, the Argo CD operator would be running on the same cluster or could run with the same permissions inside that production account. It could be a service account inside the production account that no developer, very few people have any access to principles of least privilege. So one of the big reasons why you would use GitOps, at least that I read about and I've heard people you know, chirp away about, is that it actually limits attack vectors compared to, as I've seen in my AWS days, like the CICD, AWS account that you have to guard with your life because it pokes into all kinds of other accounts where it does its building. So again, one of the big things that we didn't talk about a ton, GitOps, great for limiting attack vectors when used, when used wisely. Yeah, cool. And also, I think it, it enforces a level of governance to the, that pull request model, doesn't it? Which kind of yep. helps with these processes. No, brilliant. So yeah, we smashed through all the questions, uh, which is very good. Um, and look, Mark, this was brilliant. Thank you very much for sharing this. And I think folks really appreciate it. But even if you have any more questions, keep smashing them through in the question section. Um, and if you want to mark it for Mark, I'll ask him later or he'll be available in the chat. Sorry for, sorry for saying that on your behalf, Mark. <laughs> I'll be here till 7.30 at least. So get your questions in before then.